Um, today, I plan to just go into digital asset types. So there are two. I really have three presentations today. And most of the time, I would like to do whiteboarding and discussion because and engagement with, with, with all of you. In terms of, um, and what I'll present today, which I'll go off the script with presentation with PowerPoint and go to Excel spreadsheet. To go into what methodology I've applied to distill down the entire universe, it's a hard process. I was, we were discussing this before you came. There are 15,000 tokens. So I distilled them down to categorizing it, just like our industry. Like if you look at the existing equity space, which is classified into manufacturing, durables, it goes back into you know transportation. So for example, if during COVID, and this is like. Uh, you know, we have a correlation methodology, right? But during COVID, you, you had people who are looking at delivery and supply chain were imp impacted. So what is the impact of things like delivery agencies, impact of uh, stuff on supply chain? And that actually has impact on gas prices and everything else. So there's a correlation between the different industri you know, industry sectors. And in this portfolio construction, I aspire to drive the same synergies. I want to actually understand what is, the, what is, what is Web3O's uh, tokens? What is a layer one token? What's a layer two token? What's a DeFi token? What's a decentralized exchange token? Which is what we call a crypto capital markets, mimicking the existing capital market infrastructure. Uh, what is metaverse? What is a data element? So I, I have a classification of that. And it's funny, I review this every four months. And surprisingly, when I did this, I did one recently like three months back, but I did one seven months back, and I had seven categories. And in a matter of four months, now I have 13 categories. And I'm pretty positive if I go through the entire review process again, I will have a whole bigger set of categories that we go with it. So I'll showcase that. Respect, Respect to crypto. Okay. So for example, right now, if I were to say, uh, get a Tata stock, well, what does that mean? Tata is in every business. So you compete at the business unit level. So for example, Vistara is a company under umbrella of Tata, House of Tata's, right? And then you have now Air India as transportation stock. So they have the transportation sectors. Uh, Tanishq is jewelry. jewelry sector, right? And whatever that is, whether it's precious metals or whatever industry classification you have for that. Uh, you have Taj Group of Hotels, which is hospitality and travel industry. So you have all these different classifications. Then by just buying Tata, you're buying a holding company's asset class. May not be the same thing as your conviction says, travel will pick up this year because COVID is down. So instead of going after holding company, let me go, which is Alphabet and Google, for example, and so on and so forth. So you need to have that level of granularity Otherwise, we are simply saying, let me just go buy Bitcoin and let's just deal with it because Bitcoin is meant to be representing a, a, a crypto macro, right? To say, hey, this is the dominant. But I think there's a lot more to it because there's a whole ability for us to have extractable value of undervalued tokens and everything else. And there's a, there's a method of the madness from that perspective. But before we go into that, any questions from yesterday? And if you don't have, I have questions for you. So you have a choice. You can ask me questions. If you don't ask me questions, I'm going to ask you questions. Can I just, uh, I'm sure we discussed all the We discussed all the important things when you were gone for an hour and a half. We discussed the most important part when you, were, when you, were, when you stepped out. But go ahead, sorry. Okay, good point. Go ahead. To add okay. to this point, like, uh, the main concept of NFTs are non fungibility but because of the digital assets, they are so easy to use the table. Like someone, uh, anyone can like, copy that and put it on the internet and you do not know who it is. Yeah, so good point, Akshat. But let me dive more into it. It's not just about show off. And I think I was talking to, I'm, I'm really sorry. We've, Sanjeevni. I was talking to Sanjeevni uh, just about that. Is what is NFT? What the hell is NFT in general? Um, we know what fungibility is, right? Fungibility gives you a translation, translatable value. So you're not going back to the barter system. You 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 have a unit of account which a rupee measure, has a measurement that people are able to relate to rupee in all different areas. So you're not, you know, carrying your whole uh, sheep's and cows to be able to to exchange things of value. So fungibility provides. It's basically there's no uniqueness to it. It's just demand supply. You have a pool of Bitcoins, like 21 million, and that all of them look alike. You have 330 billion of Indian rupees, 
out there and they all look alike. And, in, and depending on the demand for that and the value for that, the value of that rupee in terms of what rupee can do changes over time. It's just demand supply curve at that point. Non-fungible indicates two things. One is uniqueness. Right? So it has to be unique. Otherwise, if, if the two things are the same, then uh, how do you discern between what has one what has value or not? To your point of, and this has become interesting in areas of art, music, creative. So creator's economy, as we call it, right, has taken a lot on fungibility, on non-fungible assets for two things. There was an NFT NYC event that happened last, last November in, in New York. And it's funny because there were like just a 10% of people from blockchain, 90% of people all creative artists. And there is a whole element of liberation to say, if you're able to create your own content, this is music, this is art, this is uh, ability for you to create a small movie and small videos, and there are so many aspiring uh, sort of you know, creators, whether it's producers, directors, who are relying on funding from some, some uh, you know, agency or allowing, you know, getting funding from some entity that allows them to do their work. And they find this NFT as a value to be able to, one, uh, appeal to people with like-minded you know, community. So community is a big part of the blockchain ecosystem. So appealing to that community, raising funds, giving them a sense of ownership in the content they create. So I don't know if you've heard, I was discussing again with Sanjeevani on this stoner cats. Uh, have you heard of that stoner cats, anybody here? So this is the next, so you know, we always talk about the fangs. Fangs are the new sort of the bigger entities. And we are looking into what are the disruptors to the fang ecosystem. And we discussed briefly yesterday in terms of social media entities to saying, do I have access to my own content? Because right now you don't, and you become a product uh, in, in eyes of the social media ecosystem, whereas you know you are you are the product to the marketers, as opposed to you owning your data, you owning your content, you controlling, which reverses the equation of what fangs do essentially. So in terms of stoner cats, was what we envision is the disruption to Amazon and Netflix type content models, where you owning a token gives you right to view. Not only you have ownership to it, but you have the right to view the content. So stoner cat was from Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis, small video. Grandma smoking pot, and she falls asleep, and pot burns, and all the cats are are, are high, and it's it's funny. It may sound stupid, but it's funny. If you look at it, it's funny. But you need an NFT to, to view it. It was a small experiment done in terms of what are the possibilities around it. So imagine you making that investment. So today, Netflix makes a hundred million dollar investment. They're expecting all the subscribers to buy into it. They have all the digital rights, and that is expecting them to be able to grow the user base. But imagine if you had. Uh, non-fungible entities, which gives you what we call as a digital rights management. So I don't know if you discussed this yesterday, but one, one big part of NFTs is giving you the digital rights because of the fact, so besides identity and data ownership, and you treating them as non-fungible tokens, we also view having non-fungible tokens as a digital rights vehicle. is the ability for you to view content. And let's say you invest in a movie that I'm making and it's a super hit, right? And, and you have the rights to view the movie. So if you want others, and they're only limited, for example, I end up selling a million tokens, right? And please, um, so what happens to that token of yours? Well, it appreciates in value. Do you have access to those markets today? You don't, probably don't. I don't think any of us here has access to, so I just, before coming here, I invested in a Broadway show, has the same thematic element, and primarily to understand what, how does this work? So one way to do that is get into it. So you have a token, let me finish the one thing and then I'll answer the question, is it gives me rights. So if you want to sell that token, you can, the secondary market for it, and you can monetize and recoup your investment that you made because you've satisfied your content, your ability to be able to watch something that you like and you love. But if you firmly believe in, let's say, a, a documentary made on, on environment because you're an environmentalist, then you would like to take the token and give the rights to more and more people for them to view these things. and and capture the data, capture the transferability, capture all the metrics which today is largely missing because YouTube kind of knows what the, what's going on with that and you have little access and, access and control to that whole element. So there's one big piece of that is community building, uh, which is changing some of the business models around, around the space. So I'll pause here and you had a question. Yeah, I mean, uh, so is it like digital equity in some sense? It is. In, in essence, you are, so I, I, don't, I don't want us to get conf confused with this meta versus some uh, some cool place that we go and hang out virtually. All this is matter was because you're transferring value from one universe to another universe with the metadata that, that attaches to it. So if you're taking digital rights management, the question is you're paying for it somehow, 
whether it's banking rails or you, you're paying with Ether and Bitcoin because those are native currencies of this world. Um, and this digital rights become an NFT token, maybe on Solana, and you're passing it on to some person who may have a MetaMask wallet. So this is all different universes that have different value propositions. And all you're doing is taking this tokenized access points and moving them in different universes. And in that movement, you're not only moving things of value, but you're also creating value in the process. Right, so for example, a million tokens, and suddenly now a billion people have seen it. So what is the monetization angle? So this goes back to our token economics. So if, I, if I'm as a, as a content producer, I decide to say I'm doing this for the betterment of the planet, here's got a million token, which means when this million token is out, that's it. So that appeals to the scarcity element of it. So most artists now are going after saying that, you know, like art world is very, very funky, right? In the sense that you create an art, artist only sees the money the first time, you go through Christie's and many of the other guys, and they basically have a big chunk, and that's, you're pretty much done with it. Same, with, same thing with your music. You get Spotify and you get Apple Tunes, which take 30%, and it may take you six weeks to six months to get that money in terms of, and with no, with complete opacity of how many times that information is, or that music has been downloaded. And in this case, these NFTs gives you direct access to say, if, you, if I give you digital art, and every time you sell the digital art, the, the component that's codified in the digital art gives you 5% or 10%, whatever you have as an artist, you decide what is your economic system that's gonna allow you to do these things. So if you sell the art to, to him, he will, I will still get 5%. He keeps a, every time the art exchanges hands, I still get 5% of the overall sale value. So I have a continued interest in that art, which today is impossible. Same thing with music. So I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, I mean, smart content is a construct. So NFT is a thing of value. So all smart content does is enforces rules. Um, not necessarily, because the thing about fungible tokens is that they all are, have to be looking alike, so which means the, the, the production of the creation. So remember, there's a process, right? There's a, there's a minting. So if you look at the entire process, there is creation, there's publishing, there's minting, there's distribution, and there's an exchange. In case of fungibility, you only are confined to this. There's a process, like there's mining staking, you have just create tokens. The token do not represent anything except the combined value of the network or the combined economic activity of what's happening in the network. Whereas in case of content, you are creating a content. You're not creating a token. You're not minting that token. You're creating a content, you're publishing the content, which means it has to go through a certain level of due diligence. And then you're eventually going through the process of quote unquote tokenizing it, which is where then you join the mainstream. And this is where, if you haven't looked into ERC-20, ERC-741, ERC-1442, all these standards come into play where you can codify the rules to say every time, you know, Tushar creates, you know, a, 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 art, a piece of art and sells it to Sanjeevni, for example, then Tushar gets X percentage. Sanjeevni sells it to, to Niharika and you still get 5%. That's codified into some of these standards and that's enforced by quote unquote smart contracts. So smart contracts enforce some of the elements to say this is what I've codified into when, when I create, when I mint a token. You cannot apply, there are a bunch of standards, you cannot apply all standards to all tokens all the time because that becomes a bit confusing. Well, te technically you cannot do it, but imagine the world where one Bitcoin will give you 2% royalty, but the other Bitcoin doesn't. You can't do that, right? So does that make sense? Yeah, so two things, right? One is, we talked about this yesterday, right? Token economics, tokenomics. Join the two words together, conjoin them together. Um, the most important part of most blockchain world. In fact, I would, if anybody's going into the space, I would spend all your energy and time on what is that economic. That's why I think, Sajid, that being an economist gives you an edge because there's a whole lot of elements in terms of how do you build a community? All the things we discussed yesterday, how do you build a community? How do you have sustainability of this project? Axie Infinity is an example. I think Axie Infinity by next year will be pointless because they, they only had enough runway for a year or two and begin to see the decline because like most gaming concepts, gaming needs a rejuvenation. So in marketing terms, there's a product. You constantly innovate the product and add on more feature to keep it 
active, keep things happening in that, in that ecosystem. So if you're not rejuvenating a product, you're not giving it new life, then it's going to just disseminate. So all, if all you're doing is play to earn, and suddenly a new game comes along which is giving you play to win, so your stakes are higher and you make a lot more money, you'll have more competitive spirits going into the new ecosystem, driving those, those elements. So tokenomics is a big part. So to your question, Niharika, two things, right? One is when you apply this to fungible tokens, this goes down to, which is probably the formula for most layer one, layer two protocols. What is the supply? What is the demand? Who are the, who are the benefactors? Who spends? Who earns? At the end of the day, just like what we do with our uh, existing sort of monetary system, right? We central banks issues money. You create M2, M3. There's a whole layer of, 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 of money creation in this. And in that case, like Bitcoin, 21 million, Ethereum, 100 million, um, Solana came with like, you know, oh, 100 million, Solana came with 100 billion. So people are adding more and more zeros to say we don't want it to go to, so the big flaw we, we think from Bitcoin, which started out as a cryptocurrency, no one's using it to pay for anything. Just like we don't use gold to pay for coffee. Right? You don't go to a shop and say, how much gold do you want and chip it and give it them. Because there's no way, gold is not fungible. It's of value, it's not fungible. So it, it becomes a store of value. So Bitcoin over time has become a store of value. So it's not performing its function of an intended function of a currency. Because over time, it's become so scarce. that And that's why all our economic models, financial models, compares this to as an inflation hedge. Because while US is pumping $6 trillion in the economy during pandemic, the supply of Bitcoin still remains the same, constant, and 90% of his mind. So there's a scarcity element of it, and scarcity, and there's a demand to it. So all those things are working, are working at play. And that's why it's become sort of the de facto standard for the rest of crypto industry, because it has the lion's share, like almost one third of the market cap of the entire crypto industry is locked into Bitcoin. But that's a point in time statement. So the question then becomes, so fungible tokens, so they all have, okay, I'm gonna have 21 million, X billion, whatever the number is, and and there was an EIP 1442, I forget the names at the moment, but the entire purpose of EIP was to have a deflationary focus on this where Ethereum was becoming more and more expensive. And unlike Bitcoin, Ethereum has what? So Bitcoin, again, is store of value, and you're simply, all you can do in Bitcoin is transfer Bitcoin. You can't do anything else. Yeah, so it has programmability in it, right? So that means you're attracting more and more ecosystem. There came a point where, and I do a lot of experiments, that I had a USDC coin, and to move the $50, I had to pay $165 in gas fees. Because the cost of Ethereum was, was too high, and as you know, I have wallet one, wallet two, smart contract. When I'm using the smart contract, I'm paying a fee to process the transactions. Fundamental, basic element to this, right? That fee was so high that it became untenable for anyone to do business on the network, right? So suddenly now you had a massive drop in transaction volume and Solana came along. And suddenly most of the traffic went on to Solana or layer two protocols. What does layer two protocol do? What does layer two protocol do? Sorry, I'm just speaking on anyone I, I see, but sorry. That's right. So for example, if it's too expensive, they all move on to, so this is layer one, they move on to Polygon is an example, and Polygon said, we'll process a transaction for 0 0.0002 cents. Negligible, cheap. So Uni Uniswap, Aave moved to Polygon because Ethereum was too expensive, because they had a business model. They were, it's unsustainable for you to lock an asset and start paying $152 for a transaction. And so what they did was introduce this EIP to have deflationary pressure, which says every fee you collect, we're gonna burn some tokens to keep the price stability around it. But what's the problem with that? What is the problem when a community decides to start mucking around with the originally intended token economic model? What happens to this concept that we were romancing with all day yesterday? You start changing the model on the fly. Doesn't that mimic our world? And then who really decides, which means, you know, does community decide in terms of, and this was a problem because the ability for you to remove tokens in the system affected people who actually wanted to be part of the whole thing where they're dedicating compute capacity, they're actually getting fees. Now you're adding a tax to that structure, which had interesting challenges. And this actually has, is an ongoing problem where when Ethereum moves from this model to a 2.0 model, 
you're changing, it's basically changing the tracks while the train is running to a whole different track and hoping that uh, that, that, that transition happens smoothly. So that is the fundamental sort of issue. I, I don't know if that answers the question. So in case of NFTs, because remember, in this case, you're dealing with minting distribution exchange. And you're saying, how do you create a token? And there's a, there's a mining process, there's a minting process, there's a staking process. For NFTs, it depends on the creators. So for example, Board Ape Yacht Club decided to have 6,000 of those JPEGs. And I think, uh, Akshat, you mentioned, like, if I can just copy and paste. Well, you have art in your house. And you may have spent a million dollars on that art. I come to your house for dinner. I actually see it. I enjoy the art. But it's yours, right? So I don't have ownership just because I'm looking at it. So because, and this is the one thing that Web3.0 aims to solve, is inability for you to copy and paste. We discussed this a bit yesterday, that today we have click, save, image it. So I don't know if you all have, we all got lost in this Twitter drama of Twitter having a tipping function using Lightning Network, which is a layer two protocol of Bitcoin. But one thing which was amiss in this entire news, but when you take any of the eight you know, pixelated JPEGs on your, as your profile, Twitter now gives you the ability to, to verify to, if you actually own that picture. So while you can still copy and paste, there are verification validation systems built into, this, into many of the applications that says, this is where you can go and verify. So the question then becomes, what is function of an art? Am I really doing it for, as Tushar put it, show off, which happens a lot because the early pioneers in this space have a lot of ether because of the function of their age in the, in the industry. But also, the fact that they want to be first because they were first in, with Ethereum Bitcoin. They have enough of those things. They want, I want to buy a first of this and first of that and first of this. So there's a lot of that happening too, like $9 million worth of apes, pictures. I cannot justify it. But I'm sure the guy who has a million ETH can say, you know what, I want that because that's first of a kind. So there's a different mindset around the whole element. And then you have element of ownership and digital rights management and ability to be able to control your identity and control your data. In absence of a framework like this, it becomes increasingly difficult for you to say, I own this data, but what are you going to do? You're going to keep all the pieces of data in a database? Probably not. You don't want to have MongoDB in your house just because you want to store, have volume data. So you have to tie in the digital rights element to your identity element and piggyback on the decentralized storage mechanism like Filecoin and IPFS to store the data and pay for it because you're going to monetize this. It becomes a business model for you too. That now you're taking Filecoin, you're taking the economic system that you need from the decentralized storage, decentralized compute, decentralized interconnect, and you're storing these in a safe place and you're paying them with coins because you're also monetizing this NFT-based token which is access to the data and handing over the DRM temporarily to a, to a clinical trials or healthcare or your physician or whatever. And that's the economic model we work with. I don't know if that makes sense. So it's not just for show off. I think it has a lot more uh, value to it. Yeah, so that's great. Um, so what happens with, you want to answer that, Javier? Sorry, I, I, you were talking about yesterday, so I'm just yeah, picturing it. Yeah, Some of that. maybe I'll give it a shot. All right. So the foundation of storage, the lowest level of technical is the same. You have files, you have blocks, you store the files in blocks, and, and, and you have a bunch of disks, and you pick, uh, you instantiate a, a database, whether it's containerized, non-containerized, whatever, you, you know, poison you pick, and you store it in AWS, and you provide characteristics, high availability, uh, you know, geographical disbursement, all that good stuff. And, and as a hyperscaler that Amazon is, uh, or Google, they will distribute the data depending on how much you pay for it. And you pay per gig and per meg. And, and that basically allows you to have some app layer that's going to some middleware layer that's hosted on, on and that gives you access to, the, access to data. Centralized control. And you pay Amazon money to do it. You don't pay the money, 
Amazon says goodbye, and you, your your money is due. Uh, in this model, you have a file. As this is the most simplistic explanation. We can go deeper into it, but maybe not. In this case is you split into different block storage mechanisms, and that goes into other many different databases, and you sort of have a hash function, and this represents this file then has some representation of a hash function that basically has the locator of all these information. This is hosted by me, Tushar, Pavia, Niharika. We all have the storage. And by simply dedicating our storage capacity, we are getting paid. Because just like Filecoin is another example, you buy a Filecoin, you, yeah, it's peer to peer. So Torrent works something like this. But except that Torrent still relies upon, in this case, you have a single file handle. And the file handler then helps you resolve the pieces of this file that's stored across it. Tomorrow, if Niharika decides that it's not worth her time, because energy is expensive in her neighborhood, she says, I'm, I'm done with this. She shuts the machines down. She foregoes the earnings she would get. But the IPFS system recognizes that and begins to move that automatically other other storage mechanisms. So all IPFS do is interplanetary file system is gives you the manage to say, that I'm going to keep high available copies of these. And as systems go in and out, I'm going to redistribute the, or uh, have an equitable distribution of these blocks. But there's a, there's a handle that basically all you have to do is have a file handle. And IPFS handles the location and, and brings it together and reconstitutes the file and serves it up. How yeah, is it Yes, similar to WebTorrent. Yes. And they need to have that, right? So remember the consistency. So if, if you're in technical space, who's, who's technical here, actually? Like technical, technical. So you don't understand cap theorem, right? Trilemma. So, tri so cap theorem is the original one for distributed computing. Trilemma is the, the blockchain version of it. Uh, definitely understand that piece. Because you, you have to keep it. You have to have availability. And you need to have partition awareness. But you cannot guarantee consistency over time. So IPFS is great. It's great for content. For financial services, we are still figuring this out. Because what's more important financial services? Security. Consistency. Security is, is, is there. Which means that if you're doing a transaction, all the instance of that data should have the same, uh, same value. Uh, otherwise, it creates inconsistencies in transaction data, which can have consequential effects on ability for you to do things like double spend, which is sort of systemic to Bitcoin preventing double spend, so to speak. And that happens in banking all the time. Sometimes you see your accounts able to catch up. But banks can roll back. You can't roll back in the blockchain world. Does that make sense, IPFS and question? There's a lot more to it, but you just know you're going to handle. And all your application needs to worry about is the handle. And IPFS does all the location reconstitution, serves the file. Similar to Torrent. Torrent basically finds those areas, except that you have a single file handle here. and. Um, yeah, it's encrypted too. That's right. It's encrypted. It's hashed. Um, you can do all those uh, other elements. Though IPFS doesn't have enough footprint, which means for that to work, you need to have more and more people hosting servers. Can people the server? Yeah, it's truly peer to peer. And they, get paid. they get paid for it. Like Filecoin came up with that. So if you had Filecoin, and you hold health storage or Chia, Chia is another layer one protocol. Chia, unlike most protocols, which I always question that, most protocols require on CPU and RAM. Uh, at, a, at a basic level, because you have a massive processing around this. Chia came with storage. So they gave you coins based on how much storage capacity you bring to the table, because they, they expected this to have a massive file. So Filecoin does the same thing, too. You need tokens. A utility called Filecoin, you need that to buy. So you use money to buy it, or use Ether to buy it. And then as people are storing your stuff, you give them Filecoin to store, store that information. So good. Have I not answered any Web3 or questions from yesterday? OK. You have three questions about Web3. Is that a coincidence? Yeah. One is, uh, I was reading about Web3 and how it's all moving towards centralized form of it. And even before start, people are not hosting servers. Even companies which are making software are not hosting servers. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's a real problem. And my next piece, which I haven't gotten time to write, I'm going to write about that, um, is exactly that topic. So Jack Dorsey, I'm sure you heard of the whole fiasco, leaving Twitter, going back to Block, or what used to be Square. He raised, we all raised it up. We all just said that 99% 90, of NFT projects, in fact, I, I think 100%, none of them actually use decentralized storage. So imagine you're paying 9 million bucks for a JPEG, which I can copy and do all this thing. We haven't really tied into. So this is what I'm just painting with NFT is the, is the vision of where we want to go with this. It's not necessarily happening at the moment, right? So we had to build an ecosystem around it. So what happens with today is it's all going into AWS and Google storage. So it doesn't. It, MetaMask is nothing but a window into the transaction sort of stream that's happening in Ethereum and other EVM compatible chains, right? And 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 so so the question is twofold, right? Uh, and Jack Dorsey raised this and he left Twitter to say that it's all bunch of VCs and A16Zs and many of the large firms who are investing into this and they, under the, under the guise of Web3.0, you're not actually getting Web3 because a lot of these projects are, are centralized, you know, centralized projects. The reason for that is, single reason, single most reason is this. Participation, I spelled it wrong, but you get the point. Participation, there's not enough participation in the ecosystem. What all we all doing? We're just buying a token, and we want a piece of that economy. So you need workers. You need people who dedicate their talent, you know, computes, you know, capacity, their memory, their CPU, and so on and so forth. In the absence of participation, you're having four guys, and they need to go this overnight. And they just okay, fine, let me go, and it's easy to launch this because remember what is the biggest why is blockchain or why are the nft or any of the defi projects coming up so fast why is blockchain industry going so growing so fast we discussed it yesterday why 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 do you see so many projects copy paste it's easy right it's all open the entire premise of this industry is transparency and code availability so you can just cut and paste the code and change a few things and call it a new project and people run towards it because there's a hope of it becoming the next big thing so in that context it's easy to say, hey, let me cut this. Let me create a, you know, a Lambda DB or whatever, or AWS, use AWS Lambda to build this. And so next thing you know, within a matter of a week, you have the whole project up and running. You got the funding. And next thing you know, you're on a roll to say, we have this. But the fundamental element is you're still relying upon the Web 2.0 infrastructure to paint the vision of Web 3.0. And in my opinion, it's a path. It's a spectrum. So you have completely decentralized and you have centralized. I think we are somewhere here. Because just like what we have seen in Web2 world, when you start seeing this password issues begin to break, then you have MFA coming into the picture. This has been raised a lot lately in the entire ecosystem is, you know, who is ready? So then you have companies like, I mentioned this yesterday, Blockstream, Block Demon, Infura, which is by consensus, and um, Alchemy. These are Web3 hosting companies which to me is a great sign. So when I go to Amazon or Google, it's still centralized storage. You have to pay your bills or whatever the case is, right? Uh, these companies are allowing you to actually host the nodes, native nodes of crypto industry. You can hold a host a Bitcoin node, you can host, you're simply paying for the hardware and, and energy and everything else because they're still providing hosting. So you're not putting it in your basement or in your backyard or in your house. You are, you are using a industrial grade a ASIC 5, for example, chipset that you need. So it's still in the quasi-decentralized model, which means that you're only, from the economics of it, you're not just renting AWS capacity. You're now fueling that model for them to create more and more and more nodes. And this is, in my, is a first step to decentralization. And this will fuel participation economy. And that's why you see massive like companies like Marathon and they have, these are investment companies, they actually have gone into mining. Even Bitcoin started with this concept, but what happened was eventually like, big corporations started mining. And yeah, that's how uh, Bitcoin, I mean, uh, Bitcoin uh, today is concentrated over like less than 10% of most of Bitcoins. And the mining is, is in many cases, is decentralized. Because if you look at what happened between China and Kazakhstan and United States, that to me is, you know what I'm talking about, right? China had a ban. 
maximum hash, hash power was in China. And China shut it down, took some time into Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has this fiasco with the Russian thing. They shut it down. Eventually, now 90% of capacity in North America. And North America was the least three, four months back because energy cost was too high. The industry now is saying, we'd rather focus on stability than energy cost. And now there's a whole race, which is why I was saying this is such an exciting time for our industry, is in terms of sustainable energy. So there's a lot of work happening in terms of using unused capacity of these server mines and farming mines to be able to pull energy. That, in my opinion, is participation economy. So I, will, I would expect in the next five to 10 years time frame, us going somewhere here. And the biggest challenge of liquidity and global macro and all the things that we discuss in this space is the lack of participation because right now, all everyone's doing is pumping money into this, our money from our existing economy with its own challenges, with its own, your favorite term, Shreyas, liquidity issues and, and stuff and moving into this. So you're inheriting those challenges because we're moving rupees and dollars into this economy, as opposed to relying upon creating the new instrument and new asset classes in this economy by participating into it. Shreyas? Yeah. might only be able to be afforded by large companies because <clears throat> what what I'm mostly seeing right now is I have to join a mining pool like let's say I have to I have to start mining it doesn't like make pool much, in or whatever yeah. yeah it doesn't make much sense for me to like start doing this by myself so I have to use something like a nice hash or or something to like like yeah. a mining pool to start yeah yeah is that in your yeah, that's a great point, uh, Shreya. So I think what Shreya is talking about is, you know, there's a difficulty bomb in, in all these protocols, right? That, that you want to be able to make sure there's equitable distribution of hash power. So mining, depending on if, so when hash power came down, difficulty level came down because they want more and more people to join. And as more and more people join, difficulty went up. I think it's a brilliant concept. So there are two things, right? Uh, have you heard of um, an Ethereum 2.0 uh, verifiable delay function? So, so I'll explain that in a minute. So in, in Bitcoin world, you're right. I think ASIC 5, which is $6,000 plus for a chipset for a machine, and I think now it's like 8,000 bucks. So as the mining difficulty goes up, as the energy equation goes up, you have specialized chipsets designed for, I think there was a bit, uh, was a bit fury, or a, there's a company in, uh, Charlie Lee's brother did that. I forget the name of the company at the moment. Yeah. No, no, there's a company who basically built, start building chips just for Bitcoin mining. Yeah, Intel is way behind in my opinion. If Intel is like, you know, uh, they need to reinvent. All these old American companies have reinvented themselves. They're just moving way too slow. Uh, but that aside, um, you're right. I think Bitcoin mining is going towards more industrial grade production. But you also look at the maturity level of it, right? 90% of Bitcoin is mined. So you have 10% left, which means now for you to extract this, squeeze out the 10% of value, you need a lot more energy to do it, right? But there's also reward at the end of it. Right, which means for you to be able, this, this is just a risk and reward equation. So as Bitcoin reduces in value, just like the inflation deflation equation, the value of Bitcoin consistently goes up over time because it's less of this available. This is the stock to flow model. Stock to flow model, just like gold. There's only finite supply of gold. And as more and more gold comes into play, there's only so much stock and there's only so much that's flowing through that stock to flow model. And so for me and you to get into this business for the last 10, last mile, it's going to be incredibly hard, which was not the case in 2012, right? So it is because of maturity, because of cost, because of investment. It is a requiring investment which is available to the industrial uh, and, and, and investment committee because that kind of money is required to host this infrastructure, cooling and everything else. But in Ethereum, this is very controversial. They have something called verifiable delay function, VDF, and you should all should look at it. So Vitalik talked about the fact that people shouldn't have, and I don't agree with this, but who the hell is Nitin? It's Vitalik saying it. Um, but the point is, this one said that you should not be able to have an advantage just because you have hardware superiority. So it doesn't matter. You bring the kick-ass processor to this infrastructure. You will not get a computational advantage and we are truly going after egalitarian distribution of compute power to make it truly decentralized. But I have a problem with that because it's like saying it's a very, uh, you know, a model that lo looks into uh, equitable resource distribution, which means what is your incentive now to bring the best and the brightest and the most fast 
computing power to the infrastructure to keep it secure and keep it resilient. And that was largely rejected by many people who say, hey, if that's the case, then let's just bring all the laptops in the world and start mining this stuff, which means you may get decentralization, but your process is going to be enormously slow. And the argument was, we can handle that because we are moving to proof of stake. And proof of stake is an incentive economics structure. It's an oligarchical model, which means that if you have more and more, more power you have, which means then that completely defies the VDF function to say, you want to have any Gatlin distribution, but yet your economic model relies upon people who have tokens. So they say, okay, fine. We will actually now build a pool where people can pool their ether for 32 ETHs, and we're going to pill random 32, uh, and this is 32 because 2 to the power um, uh, 8 there, is the fact that uh, we'll pick the random pool of these guys, and that's how we're going to randomize the whole function. So randomizing and over-randomizing is aiming to solve that, but hey, if you're rich, then you have your pool in all of these pools, so it doesn't really matter. And that's something which is still debatable, uh, because there, I think this July is when this is supposed to cut over. We'll see. To me, it's either going to make it or break it. Uh, and that'll, that'll just be a super interesting uh, history of time, because that's a massive economic system that's built on Ethereum. And that's why I think Solana and Cardano, who are built by natively on proof of stake and, 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 and uh, delegated proof of stake, are seen as, as doable, except that now Solana is accused of being more centralized because of the outages they've had in the past, two outages they've had. Does that make sense? No, so. Can we argue that decentralization actually, actually slows the whole development process? Yes, of course. Because uh, EVM still does not have encryption, but in WhatsApp, we can see end to end encryption like in my uh, I don't think that's a fair comparison uh, on that front because, so decentralization, yes, if you keep distributing the whole thing, you have resiliency, but you lose on speed. It's, uh, you don't have to argue that. It's a well-known fact and everything else. Just because WhatsApp gives you end-to-end -end encryption doesn't mean people can't see it. WhatsApp can see all of it. It's the eavesdropper who can't see it. WhatsApp has seen, like, Facebook is seeing everything. So for example, um, processor runs, and it processes stuff, instruction that's given to it. What consumes, when we talk about CP, uh, computer, as Bitcoin is accused, or any other crypto is accused of using a lot of energy, what goes, what goes into consuming consumption of that energy? Yeah. No. I'll just say it. There's IO. So IO consumes a lot of energy. There is cryptography. So CPU has on and off functions. So cryptography requires a lot of on and on functions at the same time. So it consumes a lot of energy because it has to constantly be effective around it. Uh, IO is input output. So remember this, at the end of the day, we are dealing with distribution of information consistently. It's a perfect storm. Every time you make an update to a, to a block and block gets committed to a database in one it has to then distribute all around the case before the next block is processed. That's what, how we achieve consistency in the system. So consistently, every computer is talking to every other computer from a network I.O. perspective and from a DASD perspective, which is disk. So you're writing your disk, but you're also writing to the entire network, and, and that's a massive I.O. function, and you have a crypto function. So this is what we call the perfect storm. If somebody asked me yesterday in shared capacity, who was that? Somebody asked me about sh shared capacity in cloud. Somebody asked me yesterday that. Tushar, yeah. why are you hiding yourself, man? It's a, it's a valid question. <laughs> Thank you, Bhavya. You, thanks for pointing it out. You were sitting quiet, like, man, I don't want to say this here. But that's a good question, right? So shared capacity relies upon this not being on all the time. So you're taking virtual CPUs. So if you go to Amazon or whatever, to your question, Amazon will never give you a dedicated CPU. They'll always give you a vCPU because they're virtualizing processing at you know at the virtual layer, whereas these guys give you a dedicated CPU because they know they cannot go to the shared compute model, because, and this is like the most fundamental basic element that you should, you should understand at the at the metal level. Forget about the economic models and everything else. This is what's happening behind the scenes, and this is the basic economic model of all crypto industry in general at the very basic level. All the investment going into it. 
is you have network I.O., you have disk I.O., you have crypto, and this is what the perfect storm is, where there's never unused capacity in crypto. There's no idle moment in crypto for Bitcoin and Ether. It's not like the CPU is sitting idle. It never, it never happens because there's so much compute that's happening all the time, which is why it's constantly consuming energy all the time to process transactions. And comparing that with our existing payment systems, so if you move money from here to US to our example, you have data center of your bank, you have data center of your of the clear, automated clearinghouse, Forex data centers, data centers there, Swift network. Collectively, they consume more energy than Bitcoin system for one transaction. But we don't say that because we don't know the sum total of all the six hops that we take. So Google search uses more energy than Bitcoin. But Google search as human endeavor, we love to explore and research and do all these things. So it's a valid use of energy because we as a human race is growing because of sharing of information. So there's all this debate that happens. Just keep this in mind that behind the scenes, we're dealing with the fundamental computing level of energy consumption and most amount of energy goes in input output, the network IO and disk IO and crypto. Cryptography, which is basically solving for nonce. And the third piece is again, solving the puzzle as we call it, which is basically solving for that nonce to see, you know, the reverse hash function that needs to be resolved. So those are the three, all, all high compute requirements and everything else. Does that make sense? Long winded answer. That does not My question was basically about reaching consensus. I mean, in the decentralized system, where you have to push any updates, yeah. you have to have the consensus of the majority of the people. Yeah. But that itself is very difficult. The more decentralized it yeah. gets, the more difficult it yeah. gets. So that basically gives opportunity to any new newcomer to improve on that. Yeah, the, it has been tried. Like we discussed yesterday in the stack, the technical stack, right? Uh, it's a knob. If you want complete, like proof of work is a complete decentralization, but it's a trustless system. The more, if you look at the spectrum of proof of work and let's say a centralized system, proof of stake is somewhere in between. It's faster, but it's, it's so, okay, let me ask this question another way. You have three types of, in, in this whole ocean of consensus, you have single master, no master, and multi-master systems. So if you look at proof of stock, proof of work, these are all. So what is no master? Anyone, as the name suggests. No one is authoritative. All the systems have, all have to agree, otherwise you don't reach a consensus. So it's very expensive, like Bitcoin is, right? But it's truly trustless. You cannot, no, there's no single party that can mess things up because if they mess things up, then they'll be either ousted or they'll have. So this one, again, it's, it's computationally expensive but it's, it's doing its job right without true sense of a trustless system to true decentralization. Then you have multi-master, the proof of stake type elements, right? Where we, so Hyperledger is PBFT, which I'll discuss in terms of, it's Hyperledger has the same uh, you know, element, though it moved to Raft, which is single master, is the fact that we are picking a group at random and letting the group decide, like Ethereum example that I gave. So we are reducing the chatter and clutter Reducing the network I.O., reducing the cryptography processing, so it's faster, using less energy. But that means that you have to trust the group every single time for not to make any mistakes. Single master is just like our voting system. We go around, every, for every transaction we pick a random node and let them decide. In my opinion, the most unpopular protocol that's out there. So out of all the hundreds of protocols that you hear, they're either grouped into one of these. So as you're looking at investment analysis, which I think uh, we discussed this yesterday too, look into these factors too. That they're not just about one token doing well, it's like what is the underlying element of how does a system achieve its security? What are the vulnerabilities behind it? Because while the project may do really well, six months, seven months down the line, some of these vulnerabilities may kill it at this level. So there's, there's a trade-off. There the trilemma has not been solved. And yes, there is an opportunity, but it's always a trade-off. You either get performance or you get security, but you won't get both. Unless you make it centralized, but then you're relying on some central party having the ability to trust and, you know. And the way the world works is basically we always prefer convenience and performance over security. Yeah, true. Sure. So naturally, like, I don't see decentralization, decentralization moving away from it. It's not a, a Kool-Aid, 
but there is some truth to decentralization in terms of truly creating truly global systems. Right, and, and I think some of the stuff we discussed yesterday with GDPR and data and everything else. But you cannot have a truly global system. Like Google has Google Spanner. Have you heard of Google Spanner? So when you do a search, it's the Google has this massive backbone in many different countries which, which indexes all the data and they do it at a much faster space. So they have this dark fiber that connects the various different elements. And yes, it's centralized, but it's a distributed system. So you're still able to get the same speed that you get here that I would get in the US and you have the same search because of, that in, of the indexing that's been forwarded to all these you know, areas. Question? Yeah, Karan. Yeah, that's what we have done with our, like IBM has done this with our own data centers uh, for financial services, that we have no access to your data per se. Signal, Signal has done the same thing, which means, like Discord does the same thing too. Discord, have you, are you familiar with Discord here? Yeah. yeah, you are, right? So Discord is amazing, right? To me, Discord is where the chat in the future should go, giving you the choice to say, I'll just join the Discord group, or if me and Tushar decides to create a group, we have our own servers, we can, we can then encrypt and do all kinds of other elements because we are tied to a small group and we preserve, we, we cherish our privacy, we cherish the confidentiality of our chats because it's tied to some secret of business that we don't want people to know. Um, so that is, again, if you know, look at zero knowledge proofs of home, fully homomorphic encryption, you can achieve the privacy preservation to say, hey, even I don't have access to this, this data. And the downside of that is that you ha lose some of the administrative control that if you call Signal and say, hey, can I get this, which is not gonna happen for chat, but it may be for other banking applications. And they say that, we don't have access to it either. So while our chat are non-consequential, in financial services world, there is a requirement for the industry to keep audit data. There's a requirement for industry to keep breadcrumbs of the trails because in case of a, a, a claim or in case of a complaint, they should be able to go back and track the root cause analysis. And that's where the dichotomy becomes interesting, that while everybody cherishes you know, privacy, when things go wrong, who is really in charge to solve that problem for you? So right now, uh, you cannot go to Signal to have them because there's no recourse. But that's okay because it's just chat. But if you were to actually transfer money, which is what we all have envisioned, what WhatsApp did with try to do with DM and Libra, transfer money over chat, well then that becomes an interesting problem, right? I think they have. Monero. Yeah. Monero and um, it's the Stark network, which is the same thing as Lightning Network, what El Salvador is using. Signal wants to use the same sort of infrastructure to be able to move money across or Bitcoin across. So the, there's a subtle difference though. Remember I mentioned this yesterday that most countries will allow crypto but they don't want to allow crypto payments. So subtlety is, it's fine as long as you're playing the crypto world. The moment you touch banking rails, your regulation sort of hits the roof because now you got to do all the things. So right now if I'm just moving any token, whether it's NFT or that thing, you're okay. So what many of these entities have decided to do is let's use Lightning Network to move Bitcoins. And that way we're not in the purview of regulatory elements and you do whatever the hell you want to do with Bitcoin. And after you receive a Bitcoin, it's up to you how do you want to deal with it, whether you want to go through an exchange, go through a custodial, non-custodial wallets, and so on and so forth. So most of these things you'll say, like, you know, and you'll realize, is that even legal? Well, there's a subtlety there. Um, because they can't control what's happening on the internet. They can only control when the moment you touch the banking system. Today. So two things, right? Uh, why? Remember we talked about yesterday, those layers, settlement layer. Bitcoin, Ether are truly liquid assets. I can convert Bitcoin to any of the asset classes that I have. I can. I can collateralize the Bitcoin to get USDC or some of the, so why do you say that? I, I'm, I'm just probing here. Yeah. How do I buy something with USDC in the real world? Like, are these sites, are e-commerce sites or? Anything? Yeah, Amazon accepts it. Microsoft accepts it. Back to accepts it. There are now companies that had you, uh, but these are all, they will have to do KYC for you. So, so you have to, how many, how many are familiar with the concept of Custodian non custodial wallets. You are. What is it? So basically, uh, so when we are using uh, exchanges, they are basically custodial wallets because we do not, we do 
right. That's right. So the thing is, custodial wallet, non-custodial wallet is custodial. Somebody you were given custody of your assets to somebody else, and all. So basically, was Erex, Coin DCX, Coinbase? These are all mobile apps. They're not exactly wallets, but they give you the perception of wallets. Uh, though, what you should look into is that some of these exchanges don't even give you the option of a wallet address. So Coinbase gives me a wallet address, which means that while they're keeping there's a there's a uh, gap between the coin custody and accounting system that they maintain how many coins I have. But they give me the wallet address, and the wallet address comes in, and the, is, it is nothing but a, 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 a manifestation of what is your wallet address, and that's tied to your account behind the scenes. Most exchanges, and I don't know, who has a Vazirx and Coin DCX account here? Does it have it? Do, does it give you a wallet address for all? Oh, that's great. So that's how it should be. For everything, so they give you a they give you an avenue to give you address people so they can send money to you and yeah. They had to do that for uh, because of sub regulatory elements. Uh, RBI, I mean, uh, Ministry of Finance had a had an injunction, so they stopped withdrawal at the time. So that is it's, that's okay. Yeah, and they're just waiting to be. Um, that's a reg and comp conversation, which we're not going to have here. But trust me on this. We have all these lawsuits are waiting to happen, at least in a litigious society like ours. I'm just waiting for many of the lawsuits to uh, sort of break up with Coinbase, because Coinbase does everything, and they do many wrong things uh, from that perspective. So why? I mean, uh, so if you have a, a non-custodial wallet, you can get Bitcoin in that wallet. So let's say I send Bitcoin to you via uh, Twitter. You transfer Bitcoin to your non-custodial wallet. So all that is good, unless you want to go into DEXs and go into a regulated or semi-regulated industries with crypto, because they now require you to go do KYC. So there's an FATF guidelines, which is Financial Action Task Force, which is a global entity which decides financial stability. This Financial Stability Board, Bureau of International Settlement, it's a whole regulatory college of regulators that have said that thou shall not accept payments or any transfer from non-custodial wallets because we don't know who you are. So then what happens in that case is then you have to open something like a Vazirx account. But Vazirx account will tell you that, hey, you cannot transfer this wallet because we don't know who you are. Right, and so uh, that becomes a bit more interesting point. Then you have to go through a, a cleanse process, as we call it, to be able to say, I'm Akshit and I have five Bitcoins and I want to move it here. I do my KYC at the day they record your basis uh, cost for your coin because for tax reasons and everything else. And then you're mainstream finance. But what if you don't do that? What if you're able to use Bitcoin as a mechanism for exchanging and decentralized exchanges on your own? Because at the end of the day, it's a permissionless system. So my question then becomes, do you need US dollar or do you need rupees? Today, yes, but to be able to buy food, you, you do, right? But that may change. And the question is, well, what can I exchange from that perspective? Which means if tomorrow people start accepting this because it's universally accepted, then what happens to the currency? Because at the end of the day, currency is nothing but a belief system. The won't allow that to happen. Yes, they won't allow for payments to happen through normal payment channels. But there's nothing stopping for me from coming and saying, hey, this is a gold coin from Palau. Will you accept it? You'll say, yeah, I'll accept it because I value it. And here's my house. What can anyone say? It's still that freedom of action, what we do as individuals. All they can do is tax it, from that perspective, which they've done, which is impossible to enforce in, in today's context, but we, that's for a different conversation. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, which is what I was explaining earlier with Ether, right? So Ether, EIP, 1442 or some of that, I forget the name at the moment. Uh, the idea was to, um, because ETH cost was going up and they wanted some of the fees that you pay for it to be burned. Uh, and the idea was to be able to remove some ETH from the system because they are going towards web uh, ETH 2.0, which is going off proof of stake. And there was an imbalance in terms of supply, which is what governments do all the time, the quantitative easing, quantitative tightening, which is what happened in the US. So think of that as quantitative tightening that now you're removing money from the system uh, to be able to stabilize the value of ETH as you transition to a new economic system. 
So imagine people are having 100 billion ETH and going to ETH 2.0. Imagine the mess in terms of uh, what will happen with the number of pools available because people now are staking there. Because now you're moving from mining to staking concept. So that was a whole conceptual element of what can do. And, and basically all they did was they said, we're going to take away. You still have to pay the system. But instead of paying for a fee for processing, now you have control over. So there are two things they did. One is giving you an avenue to control as to how much you want to pay for faster processing so you can be prioritized over the next guy. So not all trans transactions are created equal. The second thing is they're going to remove a percentage of what the miners get as a fees structure and, put, and burn those tokens to stabilize the supply of it. <laughs> <laughs>